come to order. This is our first public hearing of this Congress, and we're here to consider the nomination of Delwar Syed to be the Deputy Administrator of the Small Business Administration. But before we get started, I, I really want to welcome Senator Ernst as the ranking member uh, on the Small Business Committee. She has been a valuable member of this committee since, I think, 2015. Many of uh, the, the best ideas of our committee have come out of Senator Ernst, and we appreciate that very much. I am really looking forward to working together to help America's small businesses. I think we share the same passion towards the small business agenda, and I am looking forward to this committee being actively engaged. I think actually the climate is right for us to take the leadership on this. We recognize that we have to have a bipartisan product, and it's got to be one that can be shared and supported within the House. So I, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to find that spot. We've been looking to reauthorize a lot of the SBA programs for many Congresses. We used to do it regularly, and I'm hopeful that the two of us will be able to work together in order to be able to accomplish that. I would also welcome Senator Ted Budd of North Carolina. We're very happy that he's part of the committee. Uh, I had a chance uh, at the last meeting when we were voting on the organizational issues to, to welcome him to the committee, but we look forward to his participation in our committee. I also want to thank Senator Ernst for the help in the organizational work, the adoption of our rules and budget. We were able to get that done in a very expedited way. So we're off to a great start in this Congress, and I am so pleased to welcome back to the committee Dalwar Syed. Uh, it has been more than two years since Mr. Syed was first nominated for the position of Deputy Administrator. During his previous hearing before the committee back in April of 2021, I commended Mr. Syed for his willingness to serve our nation in public service. Today, I want to add my appreciation for his patience and perseverance during this confirmation process that has been marked by unacceptable delaying tactics, spurious accusations, and unrelated controversies. I was correct. It was correct for the Biden administration to nominate Mr. Syed for a third time earlier this year and principled and noble for Mr. Syed to accept. We thank you for that. The position of deputy administrator has been vacant for nearly five years. This is a disservice to the small business owners throughout our nation that have suffered tremendously due to COVID-19 pandemic. Since 2020, the SBA has provided unprecedented amount of aid to small businesses, more than $1 trillion in funding, far exceeding any efforts in the past. While the SBA has been working tirelessly to provide the assistance, the pandemic also exposed a clear need for modernization, technical upgrades, new resources, and reforms at the SBA. That is why the need of a deputy director today is more important than ever and the skills and qualifications possessed by Mr. Syed are a perfect fit for the needs of the Small Business Administration. Delaware Syed has a proven track record of scaling startups and meeting market demands. He's, he's had leadership roles in business, entrepreneurship, and public service, and he is most recently in, in his most recent position as the State Department's Special Representative for Commercial and Business Affairs, he has broadened his knowledge on matters related to trade and export. He has the support of dozens of small business organizations to understand the need to help growing number of entrepreneurs in this country. The Small Business Investment Alliance recently told the committee that, and I quote, the deputy administrator is one of the most important positions at the SBA, serving as the chief operations officer. With the position being vacant for the majority of the past 14 years, the SBA has been less efficient and less effective in serving the taxpayer public than it could have been. No business would leave a critical leadership position like this open for so long. Filling it with an accomplished executive such as Mr. Syed is a meaningful taxpayer protection that ensures SBA can prevent waste, fraud, and abuse going forward. Leaving this position vacant prevents reforms and invites inefficiencies." End quote. I could not agree more. The sole justification of this committee under the standing rules of the Senate is to consider matters related to the Small Business Administration. It is our collective responsibility as members of the Senate Small Business and Entrepreneurship Committee to ensure that the agency is working to its full potential to serve the 33 million small businesses in this country. Filling the position of Deputy Administrator with a dedicated and accomplished nominee as Delawar Syed would be an important step towards that goal. It's past time that we got this done. 
And with that, let me yield to the ranking member, Senator Ernst. Uh, thank you, Chairman Cardin. Uh, having served on the committee for several years now, I'm, I recognize the importance of this committee's work to support and protect the interests of small businesses in Iowa and all across the United States. I am truly honored, I am humbled, and excited to serve as ranking member of the Senate Small Business Committee. And I look forward to working with you, Chairman Cardin. Uh, appreciate your support as we've had many discussions over this Congress's activities and look forward to passing meaningful legislation that will support small businesses and allow them to do what they do best, which is to create jobs and support our local communities. I want to welcome Mr. Dilwar Syed, who is once again here before us as the nominee to be the Deputy Administrator of the U.S. Small Business Administration. The Deputy Administrator is often referred to as the COO of the SBA, with the critical job of overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of the agency. From addressing fraud to improving the agency's responsiveness to actually enforcing the laws that are meant to protect small businesses from drowning in unnecessary red tape, there is a lot of work that needs to be done to improve the SBA's most basic functions. And I look forward to today's hearing and learning more from you, Mr. Syed, about how you will address these issues and more. A critical component of this committee's work is to establish policies that promote rather than discourage entrepreneurship in this country. I believe it is both this committee's and the SBA's responsibility to ensure that they are not hamstrung by unnecessary red tape. And right now, that's not happening. Steep regulatory costs and the sheer volume of regulations that come from federal agencies year after year too often prevent a would-be entrepreneur from ever taking the first step toward creating their business or their invention. Federal regulations now span hundreds of thousands of pages, with federal agencies imposing over 3,000 or more new regulations every single year. Just last week, federal agencies issued 71 final regulations, the equivalent of a new regulation every two hours and 22 minutes. How can any small business keep up? The answer is, unfortunately, they simply can't. As I'm crisscrossing Iowa, small businesses continuously list overregulation as a top issue, keeping them from growing and, in too many cases, simply surviving. I look forward to hearing from Mr. Syed on how he would modernize our regulatory system to make good on his statements over the past year to promote rather than discourage entrepreneurship and innovation. I also look forward to hearing from Mr. Syed on how he would address the internal control issues highlighted by the SBA's Inspector General in his most recent report on the top management and performance issues facing the agency. At the top of all concerns raised by the OIG was the fact that internal control weaknesses limited SBA's ability to actively reduce fraud and instead increased the risk of fraud in the Paycheck Protection Program. Addressing this abuse by holding individuals accountable and recovering taxpayer dollars provided to ineligible businesses must be a top priority for Mr. Syed and the SBA. I also want to address the ongoing concerns with the SBA's consistent failure in responding to Republican requests for data and information in both a timely and thorough manner. This committee cannot serve its mission unless the agency it oversees is committed to being transparent and responsive, and that starts at the top. This nomination has been delayed due to the SBA's failure to give committee members details of how and when the Biden administration reversed the agency's determination that Planned Parenthood affiliates were ineligible for PPP loans due to their affiliation with their national organization. This committee has asked several times for the documentation and communications made to Planned Parenthood affiliate organizations. So did the Biden administration give Planned Parenthood kind of a nod and wink, um, or was there a reversal communicated by letter or email or by phone? I will not rest until this committee has that necessary information. 
And so as you can see, we've got a lot of work to do. And simply put, the SBA is in dire need of reform in many areas. And I look forward to hearing Mr. Syed's thoughts on how to address these issues should he be confirmed. And thank you very much for joining us. Your persistence is commended. Um, and thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Uh, well, thank you very much, Senator Ernst. Uh, now let me formally welcome Senator Budd to the committee. It's wonderful to have you here. We look forward to your participation uh, for America's small businesses. This thank you, Chairman. Honored to be here. Mr. Syed, we have a tradition in our committee that we ask you to take an oath. Uh, we ask all nominees that we are responsible for to do that. So if you would rise and raise your right hand, I will administer that oath. Thank you. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Please have a seat. I have uh, two questions we ask all nominees. I'm going to have you do that before your presentation to us. Should you be confirmed as administrator, or are you willing to appear and testify before the duly constituted committee of Congress when requested to do so? Yes. Are you willing to provide such information as is requested by any such committee? Yes. Thank you. You may now proceed. Uh, and again, we thank you very much for your persistence. We thank you for your public service, and we thank your family for putting up with all this issue, all these issues. Well, thank you, Chairman Cardin. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Ernst, and distinguished committee members. Uh, for this opportunity. It's an honor to be here uh, as President Biden's nominee to be Deputy Administrator uh, at the SBA. I've spent the bulk of my career in private sector. I've launched and scaled companies in software, AI, healthcare, and consumer media. I've also run large business operations at companies such as Yahoo. My teams and I have created good American jobs, delivered innovation in healthcare, and modernized customer service software used by thousands of Main Street businesses all across the country. As an immigrant who made America home some 32 years ago as a young college student, I have lived the American dream. I've also worked to bring that dream into reach for others. I learned early on that being a successful entrepreneur requires hard work, grit, and dedication to the mission. The path to success is almost never straightforward never without challenges. And I've faced down my share of challenges, and I've navigated small businesses through difficult times, including the COVID pandemic. I know what it's like to feel the burden and responsibility for making that next payroll for my employees. When the pandemic suddenly crushed demand, I remember feeling the uncertainty about what was happening in the economy and wondering how we would recover. It's not an understatement to say that SBA was absolutely essential to keeping our nation's economy afloat during those very challenging times, providing critical relief for small businesses. For many entrepreneurs, this was their very first time working with the agency. Now as we rebuild, SBA has a unique opportunity to deepen these new customer relationships and help these small businesses grow and thrive. Currently, as State Department's Special Representative for Commercial and Business Affairs, I lead America's commercial diplomacy, helping level the playing field for U.S. companies to compete and win all over the world. It's a privilege of a lifetime to represent the United States on the global stage. In more than 60 bilateral meetings this past year, I've expanded fair market access for U.S. businesses, increased protection of our IP, and promoted roughly $90 billion dollars worth of commercial deals that are creating jobs across America while very importantly protecting our vital national security interests. I'm especially proud of our efforts to democratize access to State Department resources to underserved areas here in the United States. I traveled to meet small and mid-sized exporters in Atlanta, Boise, and Frederick, Maryland. Innovative solutions I see being built in these communities can help us tackle some pressing global challenges. My civic journey began long before my work at the State Department. As I built my career at Silicon Valley, I saw venture capitalists investing around the world, but frankly, ignoring our own backyard. Why did nearby Fresno or Modesto lack the same entrepreneurial ecosystem we see in the San Francisco Bay Area and all the economic gains that come with it? Working to bridge this divide and promote inclusive growth I co-founded at my own initiative, the California Entrepreneurship Task Force, 
to connect rural regions such as the San Joaquin Valley with the networks and resources in Silicon Valley. When the pandemic hit, we launched rapid response support for small businesses. This campaign to raise awareness reached more than 20,000 small businesses. This experience was informed by my work as President Obama's AAPI commissioner after the Great Recession, when I led engagement with the AAPI businesses across the nation. While we still face economic headwinds, small businesses today are showing hope. More than 10 million people have applied to start a business since President Biden took office. The bipartisan infrastructure law is starting to put shovels in the ground across America. And thanks in part to the Chips and Science Act, U.S. manufacturing is coming back with the potential to bring our nation's industrial towns with it. These historic investments build prosperity that reaches deep into main streets and bolsters our startup ecosystems. And for the millions of new small businesses, those acts of hope, as the president put it, SBA can be an enabler of success. I'm energized to serve all of America's entrepreneurs in partnership with Edwin Guzman and the team of mission-driven public servants at the SBA. If confirmed, I will bring my operating experience of building organizations and businesses, scaling processes, systems, technology, and culture to SBA so it can more effectively and more efficiently execute its mission. In closing, I want to thank my family and so many amazing leaders across the country for their heart and support. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Syed. I must tell you, I think the numbers over the last two years are extremely impressive. We've seen record numbers of small business startups. In my state of Maryland, we've seen an incredible growth in women-owned small businesses and minority-owned small businesses. Uh, and it's been a very healthy situation, and I, I appreciate you acknowledging that. But there's one area that we always need to improve on, and that is customer service. It is not easy for a small business to be able to get through the bureaucracies of dealing with government agencies or dealing with the tools at the Small Business Administration. On, Wednesday, on Monday, I was in Westminster, Maryland, with a, with a group of veterans talking about veteran, veteran entrepreneurship opportunities. We talked about our Veterans uh, Outreach Business Center, which is uh, incredibly valuable in our state. And we have a lot of, we have now four women's business centers. We know about the, the um, small business development centers. We have the uh, MBDA programs. Tell me how we can improve the service levels so that we can help particularly the smaller small businesses, the startup entrepreneurs, to be able to access the help and partnership that we offer at the SBA and not overburden them uh, with the, the bureaucratic issues? Well, Senator, thank you for that question. Um, you know, uh, early in my career, I built a, a, a software a company that focused on customer support and customer service. And as I mentioned in my, my, my opening statement, that during the pandemic, majority of the, of, the, of the stakeholders who engaged with SBA, was, this was their first experience with, with the agency in the middle of the pandemic. So we had this opportunity to build on those first customer touch points and make sure that we can support these businesses as they look to grow and thrive. So I, I hear you, and as someone who actually engaged with the SBA as a customer myself during the pandemic, there are certainly improvements that we can make in the process. I think there's technology, you know, we wanna make sure that we are reaching you know, our, our, our businesses where they are, understand what their needs are. We are using technology processes. Now, obviously, I'm not in the job yet. Once I'm confirmed and fortunate enough to be confirmed, if I'm confirmed, I will work with the team and see what is our workflow look like? What are our processes? What is the internal capacity when it comes to you know, data on, on small businesses? How can we be more effective in reaching these various constituents that we are serving all across the country? Because one of the things that I have observed in my, my experience at State as well, as I engage with businesses you know, uh, domestically, the awareness of our programs actually goes down as you go farther away from Washington, D.C. We want to serve these businesses in the heartland. You want to serve these businesses in rural communities. And I think there's an opportunity for us to do more. So I am 
I'm looking forward to, um, if I'm confirmed, sit down with the team, understand what our customer service process looks like, what our capacity is, also what our human capacity is to take these calls and various touch points with, with, that we have with the customer. It has to be a you know, customer experience first agency. We are serving potentially millions, millions of small businesses, uh, not just for access to financing, but also for access to mentorship and advice and other resources. Thank you. I, I mentioned in my opening statement about the unprecedented increase in, in services we provided during COVID-19 and help through all the programs that were created. It started under the previous administration, and Senator uh, Rubio, who chaired the committee, we worked together and, and created the, the different programs to help during COVID-19. It continued during the Biden administration. And I would just give you my assessment. I think the programs were very successful. I thought you think we got the money out quickly and we saved a lot of small businesses from closing. But because we had to do it quickly, there were some who abused the system. Right. So my question to you is, what are the lessons learned from the programs we started up during the COVID-19? And are you committed to going after those who abuse the system to make sure they're held accountable for their actions? So, Senator, obviously I've seen um, and read about the incidents of fraud um, with the SBA programs. Um, you know, we have, to, we have to really be very intentional in protecting taxpayer dollars. And, you know, I saw despair in small businesses that I was helping with as an advocate during the pandemic. And to see that criminals um, were able to uh, deprive these small businesses for the money that was really intended for them, uh, that is obviously very disturbing. If I'm confirmed, I commit to you that I'll make it one of my top priorities to work with the administrator, who I know has put in place new um, you know, enhanced controls, but there could be additional ways that we could improve things. I want to obviously study and evaluate what the, what the state of our controls are, what we can do to bolster those controls, uh, this should be obviously zero tolerance. You know, as a business person, and I've run businesses, including consumer businesses, I have zero uh, tolerance uh, for fraud. Uh, so we need, to, we need to go in with a very strong uh, intention to ensure that we, you know, all the resources that Congress, the good work of Congress is making available for small businesses are used by them and are not, um, you know, defrauded by criminals. Thank you. Senator Ernst. Yes, thank you, Chairman, and thank you again, Mr. Syed, for joining us uh, today. And I want to start my questions off by addressing the issues from the last Congress and where uh, so many of us got uh, really concerned with some of the, the loans that were made. Um, so the committee had trouble receiving timely information from the Small Business Administration on a number of issues, including the Planned Parenthood loans, uh, despite multiple requests. If confirmed, will you commit to changing the SBA's culture of unresponsiveness and starting on day one, will you work to ensure the committee receives responses to its request for communications between the Biden administration and Planned Parenthood affiliates? Uh, Ranking Member Ernst, so thank you for that question. Let me first of all acknowledge that this has been obviously an issue. Mm -hmm. I have tracked it on the outside, and uh, I understand and I hear, and it's important to you and to your constituents. Uh, if I'm confirmed, um, I will work with the administrator to ensure that we are responsive to the request. You know, one of the things that I, I have understood is that a part of the job of the deputy administrator is to help with the oversight. Um, if I'm confirmed, and I'm fortunate to be confirmed, I, I will be able to augment the capacity of the agency uh, to, 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 to help with the oversight function and, and provide to you information that you are seeking. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and I really appreciate that. This has been an ongoing conflict. We would like to see the end of this and determine were those loans through PPP given correctly or not? And if so, we need to make sure that we are following up. If fraud was committed, we need to recapture those dollars. So I, I appreciate that answer. Um, and as I mentioned in my opening statement, you spoke regularly in your role at the State Department that you hope to harness the unrivaled entrepreneurship and innovation, and I, I love that, of the U.S. private sector and increase U.S. businesses' competitiveness globally, because we're in a global economy. Uh, do you believe that over-regulation stifles innovation and entrepreneurship, and that uh, the red tape that exists out there often discourages uh, those would-be innovators and job creators from ever getting into the marketplace? 
Senators, I bring a perspective of a businessman to this job, if I'm confirmed, and an entrepreneur who's had uh, his share of arts to climb against. So I hear you. Um, I am someone who will work with the administrator and our team to always look for ways to optimize for our, our entrepreneur's success. There is an appropriate place for regulation, um, but we want to make sure that we are evaluating and studying things that we make it easier for our businesses uh, to succeed and thrive. Uh, to your point, you know, I, I believe our private sector is one of our most strategic and important assets as a country. Mm -hmm. And it is more competitive now than it was. We're no longer the only game in town when we go abroad and, and, and wire for those deals. And we want to train, we want to help the next generation of, of U.S. companies and entrepreneurs, the next GE, the next Google, and that's coming from the heartland. I've actually spent some time with folks at the Greater Des Moines Partnership and understanding in your state what an incredible you know, energy is for entrepreneurship. So uh, we, we want to make sure that we bring all our tools, at the same time look for ways that we can make it easier to do business. Uh, so you have my commitment that if I'm confirmed um, for this role, I'll work with the administrator and our team to evaluate where we can actually improve things. Now, again, th there are appropriate places for regulation to protect consumers and businesses. Mm -hmm. But overall, um, we are advocates for businesses, and we should be making it easier to do business, not harder to do business. No, that's great. Um, I, and we've talked a lot about fraud this morning. I want to, or this afternoon, I want to go back into that. Uh, so Senator Cardin brought this up, making sure that uh, dollars are recouped from. Uh, fraudulent loans, uh, those that took advantage of the COVID situation. We want to make sure we're recapturing those dollars. Um, so will you commit to investigate all PPP loans flagged by the SBA OIG as potentially fraudulent and, and work to recoup those funds from the fraudulent loans, regardless of size, even those that are under $100,000? So, Senator, I've, I've read the um, IG report. Um, I, if I'm confirmed, I will address uh, um, some of the recommendations, the recommendations that have been made by the IG. I obviously need to understand better, and, and I will work with the administrator and the team to study all these cases, what the determination is, um, and, and, and what, is, what is the proposal that the, the, the team has to address the concerns. Um, again, as I said earlier, I am committed uh, to doing everything we can to fight fraud. It is frankly unacceptable that so much resource went wasted. We have to recover those. So you have my commitment that I work with you and this committee as well and, and the administrator to ensure that we are making sure that every dollar that was set aside for deserving small businesses reaches them. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank Mr. You, Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, and, and let me uh, just reinforce uh, the ranking member's comments. Uh, I am committed to making sure that we work together on requests for information, and we expect any requests made by this committee to be honored. I do want to point out that Mr. Syed, during the last confirmation process, made personal information available about himself that went beyond the customary disclosures that are made by nominees. He voluntarily made that information available to our committee, and it helped us uh, get through some of the hurdles we had at that time. And let me also assure you that there has been information in regards to any entity that participates in an SBA program, there is certain information that we will make sure is always available. There are some proprietary information we have to protect, but within that confine, any organization that, re that participates in the SBA is subject to oversight. Uh, I may disagree somewhat with the way the ranking member characterized the response, but we will work together to make sure that that information is made available to the committee. Senator Rona. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, Mr. Syed, it is very good to see you. And uh, do you have family members here today? I, I do. My wife and my son are right behind Where me. Are you? Very good. Thank you so much, because as far as I'm concerned, you should have been confirmed a long time ago, and I'm glad that we now have this opportunity to uh, do the right thing, because it is really uh, crazy that at a time when small businesses are in need of the support of the SBA, that this position has been vacant for many years, and you are uh, very, very highly qualified, uh, to say the least to take this position and to, and, and to move the SBA. I'm really glad also that the SBA administrator, uh, Isabel Guzman, did come to Hawaii. She spent an entire day meeting with our small businesses and, and to be introduced to the entrepreneurs who 
uh, really uh, help to move Hawaii's economy along. You are an immigrant. I am. Right? So uh, you're also an entrepreneur. You wanted to, uh, you, you started your own business. What was it, uh, was part of the, the impetus for uh, wanting to start your own business uh, and be an entrepreneur, part of your immigrant experience? Can you talk a little bit about what motivated you? Uh, that's a great question, uh, uh, Senator Hirono. Um, you know, immigrants um, have a drive. Uh, they're on the outside, and they're always looking to see how they can go forward. And uh, clearly having, having that, um, um, that, that energy uh, that I got to make the most of this incredible opportunity to make America home plays a big role. Um, you know, I'll say, Senator, my story um, is only possible in the United States of America. I was born in Pakistan. I came here as an international student to call it the Worcester in rural Ohio, so very close to that part of the state. And, and here I am sitting in this room with, with incredible leaders uh, for this opportunity. But clearly, the, the path to entrepreneurship is tied to immigration. If you look at the San Francisco Bay Area, which is home to our innovation, uh, and now we're obviously spreading it around the country, almost half of all founders who have founded a startup were born outside the United States. And so, and again, you can see this in, in all businesses of type, whether it's in Iowa or it's in North Carolina, that immigrants play a big role. Uh, so part of my, my, my immigrant roots, um, that has been an extra sort of push for me. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's also been about solving a business problem, right? Creating jobs, uh, supporting the communities that we serve. Um, and I've had a civic track uh, from the very early days, um, you know, including when I was in business school. So, uh, so yes, you know, it, it has played a role, but it's also been about solving business problems. Well, you have hands-on experience in doing that, and I completely agree with you that immigrants who come to this country, and I know you know that I want to, that you have a deep appreciation for the opportunities that this country affords, opportunities that would not have been available had we not come to this country with usually very little. I don't know about you, but I think you come from humble beginnings, as do I. But it is a major in, in, in imperative to give back to a country that provided opportunities that we would not have had otherwise. So I have no doubt that you have a commitment to the SBA and the fact that you uh, stuck it out for the last two years uh, as you were prevented from being confirmed uh, is also a testament to your commitment. The last time you were here, we did have a chat about how important it is to reach out to minority businesses. In Hawaii, that would be the native Hawaiian businesses. And at that time, I asked you whether you would be uh, committed to work with me to support the various uh, programs for native Hawaiians. And I would say to uh, the indigenous uh, small businesses throughout the country, that would be Alaska natives and American Indian uh, business people. Will you have that commitment? Absolutely, yeah. Senator, I will. Thank you. There are, um, the SBA Office of the Inspector General, OIG, published its annual report focused on the top management and performance challenges facing the SBA. Many of those challenges would require the attention of the Deputy Administrator, who is responsible for the day-to-day -day, uh, management of the agency. And, and, and yet, with that kind of an important uh, responsibility, this position was uh, left open for five years. Uh, can you speak to how you would uh, work to address uh, these um, management, management challenges as de deputy administrator very briefly because my time is running out? Um, so, Senator, um, I am an operator. I come to this job, if I'm uh, so lucky to be confirmed from the business experience of building organizations, running organizations. First, like I always do when I start a new job, you want to evaluate uh, what the current state is. So I'll spend some time understanding what are some of those operating challenges that we need to overcome and then work with the administrator to address them. Um, this is an agency that is, uh, you know, a, a, a in the front line of supporting our small businesses. It is the most critical time as we are still, you know, undergoing this recovery. And so we need to make sure that we, we build the capacity, the muscle, the processes, our systems, use technology where it's appropriate, enhance things uh, to make sure that we have the back of our small businesses. So I'm looking forward to doing that if I'm confirmed and leverage all my 
uh, operating experience as a, as a businessman um, um, and, and bring that uh, to the agency. And as you mentioned, th this role hasn't been filled. In fact, my understanding is for most of 14 years hasn't been filled. And I work at the State Department. We have, you know, I see the incredible support we get from our deputies. So um, there's a lot of thoughts I have. I'm, I'm, I'm going to reserve that judgment until I actually get in the job. But absolutely, you know, my focus will be to make sure we build the capacity of the organization. When we talk about modernizing, there's an opportunity for us to learn some lessons during the pandemic and see what we can improve as you move forward. Thank you very much. I look forward to working with you. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Budd. Thank the chair for your kind welcome earlier and the ranking member as well. Um, Mr. Syed, welcome again. Thank it's uh, good to meet you and good to see your family here with you. I appreciate your background as an entrepreneur and a small business person and the job creation that you've done. Um, some concerns I have are about the potential impact of ESG policies on small businesses, which I think they could increase costs, um, regulatory burdens for hardworking entrepreneurs. I think these policies are often based on misguided science and driven by political ideology rather than sound economic principles. So could you talk to us a bit about your views on ESG and how you believe the government should approach this issue in regards to small business in particular? Senator, th thank you for that question. Um, you know, the way I look at this role and the agency's mission is to support small businesses. Um, I will always optimize for that. Um, you know, there is clearly uh, an equity lens we need to have. And the equity lens is also about serving the uh, underserved businesses. Those are both about the regions, whether it's rural uh, parts of the country or certain communities. But at the end of the day, the, uh, we are focusing on ensuring that we are helping small businesses succeed. That, it, that is where I would always optimize for uh, working, working with the administrator. So let me follow up on that. When you talk about equity or, or equality, I don't want to conflate the two. They're very different linguistically. But are you talking about equality of opportunity or equality of outcome? What I'm referring to, Senator, is that um, everybody has a fair shot at succeeding. You know, we want to make sure that a rural business in North Carolina has as much access to the opportunity to, let's say, work, work with us on our programs um, as a business uh, in the DMV area. I, I was earlier in my statement referring to the fact that you know, I spend most of my time in San Francisco Bay Area. If you drive three hours south of San Francisco, you go to Fresno, uh, that place looks very different from Silicon Valley. And why is that? We gotta close that gap. That's a rural part of our state. A third of our state is Central Valley. And so I feel very passionate that we gotta make sure that when you go outside the metro regions, you gotta you know, help them rise. And there is just so much uh, opportunity for potential for us to get those businesses off the ground. So, so my view of equity is not just uh, obviously communities, minority and brown, brown, black and brown communities, but also rural regions, veteran-owned businesses, women-owned businesses. Today is International Women's Day. We still have some ways to go to support women-owned businesses. So, so that's a much broader view. Uh, we are a diverse country, and we got to take care of make sure all boards rise. Thank you. I want to shift gears. Uh, I think the chair and the ranking member have both mentioned the concerns with fraud. Uh, that's especially the one that's that's been reported with many of the SBA's lending programs, in particular the COVID era programs like PPP or EIDL or EIDL. Um, a May 2022 OIG report found more than 70,000 loans totaling more than $4.6 billion in potentially fraudulent PPP loans. Uh, the IG also found SBA did not have an organizational structure with clearly defined roles, responsibilities, and processes to manage and handle potentially fraudulent PPP loans, nor did they establish a sufficient fraud risk framework. A more recent estimate found that 1.4 million PPP loans totaling over $64 billion were likely fraudulent. A huge amount of dollars. Meanwhile, the SBA continues to move forward with proposed rules that would remove prudent underwriting standards, including weakening affiliation rules around the SBA 7A loan. Uh, Mr. Syed, will you commit to work on rescinding the current lending proposed rules and ensure that adequate guardrails are in place to prevent future fraud and risky loans in SBA's core lending programs? Senator, as I said earlier, in response to Senator Ernst's um, questions, I am um, committed to ensuring that we do everything in our power to fight fraud. Uh, it is unacceptable that so much of the public resource is, is not going to the deserving folks. Um, I'm not in the job yet. I, if I'm confirmed, I look forward to actually evaluating, studying these things. 
understanding where we can improve things. I know the administrator has put in place uh, you know, more, more anti-fraud measures, but there could be more opportunities for us to do better. So that's what I will, I will commit to you. Um, obviously, we look forward to addressing the IG concerns, again, if I'm confirmed. As I mentioned earlier, um, as a businessman who has often run consumer businesses, I have zero tolerance uh, for fraud. It, it's just something we can do better. Uh, there's role of technology, there's role of processes, workflows. Um, and again, this agency had to stand up at a pretty difficult time, and we can certainly evaluate where we can do better. Thank you. Chair, you'll thank back. You, Senator. Yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you, Senator Bud. Senator Coons. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Cardin, Ranking Member Ernst. It is great to be back. Uh, to have a quorum, uh, to be holding a confirmation hearing, uh, and uh, God willing to be able to move forward. Um, the American people expect us on the Small Business Committee to work together to resolve our differences. This has been one of the most productive uh, committees I've served on in my dozen years here, both legislatively and substantively. And uh, Mr. Syed, I am uh, very hopeful that we will at long last see you confirmed to be the Deputy Administrator, um, I think your personal story, as you said, is one that could only happen in America. Your experience uh, as an entrepreneur and a business executive, someone with IT um, skills and capabilities, uh, makes you, in my view, unquestionably qualified for the job. Um, the SBA needs help. I mean, it needs, as you've heard from my colleagues, oversight, engagement, advocacy. We have asked the SBA um, in recent years to do things it's never done before at a scale and speed it's never done before. And the data that I see about small businesses saved, um, business closures, you know, job loss avoided, are really impressive. Um, was it all perfect? No, because um, we knowingly agreed that what we needed was speed of response in the face of a once-in-a-century pandemic that shut down most of our economy. So um, I did want to just ask you a few questions, if I could. Please. Um, as the Special Representative for Commercial and Business Affairs now at the State Department, um, you help our businesses export, every one of our states. Um, our businesses, small, medium, and large, look to be able to export, whether it's chickens from Delaware, perhaps other, <laughs> other, right? Maryland and Delaware, big chicken exporters. I can imagine that the senator from Iowa might be passionate about pork, maybe some other uh, elements of the barnyard. There's, you know, there's technology, there's services, there's manufacture, there's agriculture. Um, how will that experience um, that you have currently, you're currently having, um, help inform your work supporting small businesses in all our states as we seek to continue to grow our exports? Absolutely. Uh, Senator, thank you uh, for that. Um, you know, I, um, I represent the U.S. private sector state department, and I have done a lot of uh, work in helping advance deals. What I've seen is commercial diplomacy um, a lot of times is focused on larger companies. While I'm proud of United States companies that are large, uh, you know, creators of jobs, but there's an opportunity for us to do more for the next generation of large companies. And the lens that I would bring to this job, if I am lucky enough to be confirmed, is that how do we... How do we steer some of those resources more towards mid-scale companies? I'm, I'm reminded of one story very briefly, if I may share. I traveled to just outside Boise, and I met this company called IVI Systems. They make uh, uh, storage uh, technology for root produce, for onions and potatoes, speaking of vegetables. And, and you know, they've had a, a business that does very well in the Northwest and are looking to export. And with Russia's aggression in Ukraine and the resultant uh, food insecurity challenges, now they can supply this equipment in India and Africa to extend shelf life for produce. And they're seeing the business rise. It is absolutely conceivable a company like that can become a powerhouse globally. Now, they don't know the resources that exist today, right, in various agencies, including at state. So we've been really trying to democratize access to these resources and our programs to those kind of companies. Today, one, less than 1% of, of small businesses export. Um, we want to make sure that we succeed as a nation, as a private sector, which is our biggest export to the world. And we have to bolster that by making sure more companies are doing that. So I'll bring that global lens of global marketplace and the opportunity that exists there. Um, in most of our allies and places, people still want to do business with, 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 with the U.S. companies. We've got to show up. And there's a role for agencies to play here, whether it's SBA, and of course, we work with Commerce very closely, and FCS, and State. You know, my team does a great job as well. So I, I look forward to bringing that perspective uh, to this role if I'm so uh, lucky to be confirmed. Thank you. I was just on a bipartisan um, CODEL to Zambia, South Africa, Botswana. Um, vibrant, rapidly growing economies that want American businesses. Uh, there's a small bridge manufacturer 
uh, in southeastern Pennsylvania. They started building the bridges for Patton's Army in the Second World War, so they have small modular bridges that can be used, you know, for minor tributaries. Right. Uh, they do their uh, zinc galvanizing in Delaware. They export out of New Jersey. They're manufactured in Pennsylvania. They've gotten contract after contract, 300 bridges in That's right. you know, DRC, 150 bridges in Ghana. We have enormous opportunities on the continent of Africa. I'd love to work with you on that. I had another question about IT upgrades, but I think I should yield my time, Mr. Chairman, in the interest of advancing your nomination. Delightful to be with you today. I look forward to a reinvigorated committee. Thank you, Thank Senator, you Senator Coons. Senator Hickenlooper. <laughs> um, great to see you again um, and to uh, finally be able to move forward on your, your nomination and get you confirmed. Uh, obviously, after spending decades of uh, advocating for and helping grow uh, underserved entrepreneurs, you are in many ways uniquely suited for the job that is waiting for you and has been waiting for you. Um, immigrants like yourself have, have helped start uh, almost one-fifth of the Fortune 500 companies, which is an amazing statistic. Uh, they've founded more than half of America's billion-dollar startups. Um, and yet research indicates that immigrants really don't understand, aren't aware of what's available, what the resources are available. How could you, what can you do at the SBA to make sure that that, that information is conveyed? Yeah. Uh, Senator, um, what you just said about the awareness of our programs, um, that is that is something that I feel is, we can always do more when it comes to a program. There is, we have incredible resources. We have programs, we have amazing public servants, and I find that um, the information doesn't, there's a lack of awareness in many communities. It, it is for sure the case with immigrant, it's also the case with underserved regions um, in rural regions. Folks just don't know. And one of the things that I've done at State about in my current role is, we just took what we have, but we went double down on telling the story of all that we had. And I have gone around the country saying there are 1,500 economic officers at our missions and embassies around the world. Part of their job is to help our company succeed. Most people don't know that. We have to keep talking about this. We have to, we, went, we talked about customer experience, make sure we communicate. So if I'm lucky enough to be confirmed, I'll make sure that we are telling the story. I know the, uh, the administrator is out. She's getting the message out as well on the road. The, but we do need to raise awareness. And there are tools now where we can do that. Great, perfect. Um, today is International Women's Day. It feels like an important day to note that women-led startups received only 1.9% of venture, uh, venture capital funding last year, 1.9%. Right. It's appalling. Uh, entrepreneurs in rural, urban communities also struggle to get their fair share. They are com completely ignored in many venture circles. What can the SBA do to offer these folks more affordable access to capital? For, the, for these underserved borrowers? So, um, Senator, obviously, like you, as you said, less than 2% of the VC dollars go to women firms. I mean, we saw in Silicon Valley in modern experience, um, you know, we had long ways to go to ensure equity when it comes to women entrepreneurs and founders. Um, SBA does have some programs. I am looking forward to understanding better what we can do more there. But one of the things I, I feel strongly is that we have to be more intentional in connecting with those stakeholders. So we are hearing from them. You know, one of the things that I that I was lucky enough to do in the last couple of years was get to know a lot of our resource partners at the as various organizations. And there is some good feedback that they provide us where we can, that can inform our outreach and our engagement with these communities. Um, we serve a very, very diverse set of stakeholders. And we have to be all our ears open and to get the feedback and see that we are, I mean, frankly, uh, reaching them where they are, modernizing our approach. I mean, just in the last few years, after the pandemic, the country has changed. It has shifted, uh, to whether it's either women entrepreneurs or immigrant entrepreneurs. We, it's an opportunity for us to think afresh about our approaches to the outreach and engagement with these communities. Great. Uh, I'm going to ask another question, but I'm going to let you respond to it. I'll just submit it, because I want to make sure that we have, get everybody's questions in. Um, but digital workflows using artificial and machine learning, yeah. uh, these techniques can make routine processes more efficient, help identify fraud. Uh, improve customer service. So when you get time, I, I think it's important to note out that 
how can we integrate the, some of those new technologies to make sure that the SBA runs more, yeah. is more successful and more efficient? But don't answer now, because I'm going to yield my time back to the chair. Senator Rosen. Good luck. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ranking Member Ernst. It is nice to be back. I agree, and I appreciate Senator Coons um, for mentioning trade and export because I'm chairwoman of the Tourism, Trade, and Export Subcommittee on Commerce, so uh, we have a, a lot to do, And uh, but today we're going to focus on families first because it's International Women's Day, and we know that women are the primary caregivers. But I'm going to make one last plug. Nevada-owned women businesses, we've led the nation to women's startups for the last 10 years, so uh, I'm pretty proud of that. But one thing the SBA does, and Ranking Member Ernst and I have a bill here, uh, we want to be sure that uh, we're expanding the loan eligibility for child care providers. Because in Nevada, parents of nearly 75% of children under the age of five don't have access to a licensed child care provider whether it's because of long wait lists, lengthy distances, high costs, so many things that can make child care um, unavailable or unaffordable. Um, and really, in many cases in my state, child care is more expensive than a year of college tuition. And so currently, only for-profit child care providers have full access to SBA's loan products, while nonprofit providers only have access to SBA's microloan program, which is capped, of course, at $50,000. Other loan products, as such as the 7A or 5 or 4 loan programs, they're just off limits to these businesses. So this is really blocking access to capital for nonprofit child care providers uh, to establish those affordable and ex um, facilities or expand existing ones. There are child care deserts all across this nation urban and rural. It's something the ranking member and I uh, are passionate about. It's so it's why yesterday uh, we reintroduced the Bipartisan Small Business Child Care Investment Act. Um, it's going to allow these nonprofit small businesses, the child care providers, to participate in SBA loan programs. And so, Mr. Syed, if confirmed, will you commit to working with our offices to advance this effort to provide nonprofit child care providers access to all the SBA services so we can find good ways to care for our families? Senator Rosen, thank you for sharing that. I, if, I'm, if, I, if I'm confirmed, I look forward to working with you and Senator Ernst. I know this has been an important uh, subject, and, and I hear you. Uh, there is a, there's clearly a need for that. So we will do. Thank you. Um, uh, we're going to move on to, of course, small business while you're here. And uh, for those who don't know, 90, not over 99% of businesses in Nevada are small businesses. And uh, our entrepreneurs face numerous hurdles in starting a business, um, developing a business plan, registering the business, understanding compliance requirements, depending what that is. You have to make it maybe get permits, licenses, and more. And um, I've heard more and more from Nevadans about the complex process of getting their business off the ground and just not knowing um, really how to navigate uh, what they need to do. So it's critical, I believe, that the federal government create a more streamlined process to cut through this red tape, make it easier for those entrepreneurs to start um, their business more easily. So I introduced the bipartisan one-stop shop for small business Licensing Act uh, with Senator Capito, and that is going to require SBA to create uh, a centralized website for state and local licensing and business permitting information, materials for small businesses that they can um, really just have that one-stop shop to go to so they can do what their passion is. And uh, this is really building on the success of similar legislation, setting up a portal for federal regulations that passed last year. So Mr. Syed, if confirmed, what actions do you plan to take to ensure it's easier for entrepreneurs to navigate uh, the bureaucracy and the hurdles to get their businesses up and running? Senator Rosen, I can, as an entrepreneur myself, I can tell you uh, when you're starting a business, yeah, you're often in the dark uh, about some of the basics, like where do you go? And, and that information is not readily available, even though the information exists. <laughs> so it's a matter of communicating. Um, I obviously am not in the job yet. Uh, if I'm confirmed, I will study, assess, evaluate you know, the proposal that you have here and see how we can streamline this. Some of this stuff sounds pretty simple. It should be doable. And again, um, the, the broader theme here is it's about raising awareness of what we already have, making it simpler, simpler to access information you know, with the tools and technology we have today, it, it should be something we should be doing more of. 
Yes, I, I agree. Using the, the front end technology to point somebody to one space, make it easy for, we're used to using apps and doing all this, so we should be That's able right. to make it easy for people right. to navigate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member Ernst, for this hearing. Mr. Sayed, it's good to see you, and I'm glad that we're finally moving your nomination once again. Um, one of my top priorities is helping small businesses, especially those in historically underserved communities. Um, and I wanna make sure they can access resources and capital to grow their businesses. As you know, the SBA should play an important role in helping make sure federal resources reach these communities that have traditionally been overlooked and ignored. The agency, with the help of Congress, has made progress in this effort. However, I know that more can be done to make sure that federal resources are successfully reaching the entrepreneurs and small businesses who truly need them the most. Uh, given your experience in the Obama administration conducting outreach to communities of color through your role um, on the Advisory Commission on AAPIs, how do you plan on improving SBA's outreach to underserved communities and communities of color, especially where SBA's resources have traditionally struggled to reach? Um, Senator Duckworth, uh, thank you, and thank you for your support. Um, you know, this has been a passion of mine. I've seen, you've, you've seen a theme that I have shown up in places that I often drive by. I've also shown up in communities that often are ignored. Um, you know, I served in the President's AAPI Commission, President Obama's AAPI Commission, after the Great Recession, and one of the stats that stayed with me forever, and just to speak of the Asian American community, that when... Um, when an API uh, lost a job, she or he took the longest uh, uh, than anyone else to be able to get back into the workforce because the networks were insular. And so every community has their fair share of challenges and we have to see them and we have to, we have to think about how do we address. Again, we have the resources, we have the programs, we have the heart. And this is something we all can agree on, this committee and, and, and obviously the administrator, and we need to just make sure that we are, we are leaning in more. Um, if I'm confirmed, I look forward to what the programs are. I bring that experience, I bring that network, as you know very well from the AAPI community, from the black and brown communities. Uh, many of them have gotten to know during, uh, into my work as advocate in California for small businesses. Also in my job today at the State Department, we have a pretty strong outreach um, to business communities that are that are somewhat disadvantaged. Um, so that will be that will be a priority for us. It is the president's agenda as well. Mm -hmm. You know that is core to his his policies. Um, uh, so so again, I think we just we need to recognize that every community has their sh set of challenges and they are unique at times. Uh, again, whether it's women, whether it's you know women, uh, whether it's veteran-owned businesses, AAPI-owned businesses, black and brown communities. So um, I commit to you that we will, I, if I'm in the job, I will work with the administrator to be very alive to that reality and do our best to address those communities' concerns. Thank you. And, and building on that, I'm, I'm also interested in um, strengthening these businesses um, uh, and, and their relationships across the world, mm -hmm. not just here in the, domestically. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit about your recent role serving at the Department of State as the Special Representative right. for Commercial and Business Affairs, and, and if you've taken anything away from that position um, that could particularly help in uh, shaping SBA's role in assisting American small businesses access overseas uh, markets or to build stronger supply chains with ally partners who are may, may not be domestic partners. Absolutely, Senator. Less than 1% of U.S. small businesses export. And we were just talking earlier that there is so much opportunity. I see these gems in communities around the country who can be really solving major problems in the world, exporting. I also see a role of diaspora communities. You know, AAPI is one community that roughly, you know, half of the APIs are born out of the United States. They still maintain networks. Those are critical business relationships. In Southeast Asia, we see that. When I was at APAC, we talked about the role of diaspora in, in bridging that, you know, potential for companies to export, leveraging their business networks, familial networks, and so forth. Again, there's incredible opportunity. I bring that lens uh, to this job if I'm so fortunate to be confirmed uh, to make sure that we are, you know, we, are, we are leveraging all these assets we have, relationships we have in our communities uh, to be able to do more business abroad. We have to show up. You know, one thing I say all the time, and I get feedback from our allies when I go around the world uh, promoting business, that what can we do more? They say you have to show up more. You have to be more aggressive because we are getting sometimes outcompeted. And so we have to be more mindful as a nation to build a private sector for the next generation. Thank you. 
Um, very quickly, while I still have time, I want to express my concern over SBA's proposed rule on small business lending companies. Uh, specifically, I'm concerned that allowing fintech or financial technology companies to participate in SBA lending without any additional oversights or safeguards could threaten the longstanding integrity of SBA's loan programs. I hope that if you're confirmed through this new role, you'll work with my office and the committee here to address our concerns with this new policy um, allowing fintechs access to the loan programs. Um, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I re yield the remainder of my time. Actually, I'm over time. <laughs> well, thank you, Senator Duckworth. Uh, Senator Ernst and I have jointly sent a letter to the SBA concerning the proposed rules. So uh, we, we join you in that concern, and we will certainly share the information we get from the, from the SBA. Just wanted you to know that. I just really want to follow up for the committee briefly on the concerns about going after those who have committed fraud or those who have made mistakes uh, in regards particularly to those programs established during the COVID-19 pandemic. I, I just want, I guess everyone to understand there's joint responsibility here between Congress and the SBA. We intentionally made decisions during the creation of, of these programs to allow the money to get out quickly. Just give you a couple examples. We were using the, uh, the 7A lenders uh, for the, getting the money out under the PPP program, and we knew that a lot of the smaller businesses didn't have existing relations with banks. If we're gonna be able to get that money out quickly, all of the regulatory requirements of the banks would make it very difficult for those loans to get out. So we. Intentionally, this was a decision that we made in this committee to relax dramatically the requirements for the banking community in order to make loans and held them harmless from areas if, if they didn't have the information that later proved that the borrower, for example, had that anti-laundering and those types of provisions. We eased up on that a little bit. The second thing, is, if, if, if I remember correctly, is that we did not require documentation for the needs requirements in most cases. We just allowed it to be self-determined by the applicant. And a lot of the applicants were, were using third-party sources that did not bother even asking the applicant about the needs criteria. And we ran into challenges there. That was an intentional decision we made, Democrats and Republicans. We, we haggled a little bit because uh, we argued as to what level the SBA should be reviewing the loans. Uh, some of us took a, a lower level than others, but we reached a compromise, and it was a bipartisan compromise. I just mention that because the SBA, th this pro these programs were administered, I think, very, very well in achieving the objective of keeping small businesses alive during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And if fraud was committed, we want to go after the people who committed fraud. There is no justification for fraud. So we want to make sure the SBA has all the resources and tools they need in order to go after those who abuse the system. And you'll find that I think every member of this committee will be wanting to give you the power and tools and resources you need in order to be able to go after those who've committed fraud. But I just really want to make it clear that the SBA was working with a different set of rules during the COVID-19 than would normally been applied and new programs, and it was a challenge on administration. Senator Shaheen. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and um, Senator Ernst. And thank you to Mr. Syed for your willingness to continue to be considered for this position. As Senator Cardin pointed out, small businesses across this country have had a very challenging last three years, as you appreciate, and in New Hampshire, um, has been, it's been no different. And one of the things that has helped our small businesses get through this last period has been the district office in New Hampshire, which has um, been critical in providing support to our small businesses and ensuring that they know where to look for resources. Will you commit to uh, supporting district offices with the resources, information, and clear communication that they need in order to best serve their local communities? Senator Shaheen, um, we have talked about the importance of engaging with small businesses um, in communities, rural communities, in communities that are far from metro areas. Um, so I share your um, 
I share your priority in making sure that we are present. Um, I, I commit to you, if I'm confirmed, to look at what our current resourcing is for, uh, for, for SBDCs and, and how we can be supportive. Okay, not just the SBDCs, but I'm talking about the district office. Sorry, my, my apologies. The district offices, yes. Um, I think there have been some communications from um, SBA in Washington that have been confusing to district offices over the last couple of years and have raised concerns that um, the operating budgets that they need to continue to reach out to the small business community in states uh, may not be there because of uh, changes in the way Washington views the role of the district offices. So as the deputy administrator who would be focused on operations of the SBA, yeah. will you commit that this is something that we need to do and ensure that our district offices have the resources they need? Et cetera, I, conf I, I commit to you that if I'm confirmed, I will review this, work with the administrator and the SBA team to see that those district offices are provided the appropriate resources. Okay. That sounded a little bit like a caveat to me, so I'm going to come back to you after you've had a chance to review the situation and ask you um, what the commitment is to ensure that those district offices get the support they need. Thank you, Senator. Um, one of the other areas that I have been very focused on that's been important in New Hampshire is exports and um, the STEP program is, has been very important in supporting our small businesses as they try and export. Um, in 2021, New Hampshire saw a 14% increase in our exports and I attribute the STEP program to helping with that. It's legislation that I introduced um, way back when. And I think there's um, tremendous interest in the program, but there are some concerns about how to make it work better. Um, one of those is concern that I hear from some of our small businesses about a lack of flexibility in using the STEP funds. So I know that you've been spending some time in this interim working on trade at the SBA. Can you? Talk about what your experience has been with the STEP program and how you think we might make it work better for small businesses. So, Senator, we, we, we had a discussion today quite a bit about export potential. You know, less than 1% of SM, uh, small businesses export, and there is so much opportunity for us to get those businesses to be solving major challenges in the world with their products and services. Um, I haven't had an experience with the STEP program. My current role at the State Department, um, we have our own set of commercial resources that we have, which are pretty tremendous. And I do think the SBA can be part of the intergovernment uh, partnership. Um, it is not today that, that it is not as active as it should be. Um, you know, we've talked earlier about there are 1,500 economic officers around the world. You know, I, I, if I'm confirmed, I want to make sure that they're educated about what SBS programs are, how could step grants be actually be part of the tools we can use to, you know, promote small businesses exporting. Um, that's something I'm very passionate about. I think that's probably one of us, one of our most untapped growth potential as a country. Uh, we just we just need to do more there, and I need I look forward to uh, learning more about what are some of the opportunities that are with existing resources and how we can also work together with this committee uh, to frankly you know, explore whether there are more opportunities for us to get, generate more resources to support these companies. In general, what I see is there is just lack of awareness on part of small businesses to even know that there are these opportunities that they can get uh, to get help for a trade delegation or to get on a delegation. or to, They don't even know where to go. And, and I have shown up in some of these communities. I went to Atlanta, Georgia, I went to Boise, I went to Frederick, Maryland, and, and folks were surprised to hear that there are all these programs that exist. That's a common theme I hear in general, and I think we just need to close that gap as quickly as we can, um, you know, especially as we are going through this recovery, and there's definitely an energy, especially in the underserved areas um, from these businesses to go abroad, and, and we see massive need uh, where we can plug in as a small business community. So do you see a willingness on the part of the commercial service at state to, to work with SBA on 
this kind of outreach and making business more aware of what's available? So, Senator, I can speak for the economic officers at the State Department. FCS, obviously, is a commerce department um, entity. Um, but I can also say we work with them very closely. They all uh, would be happy to get more support from more uh, colleagues in Washington. I mean, that's just the reality. We all, you know, I go through some of these posts. And by the way, many of these countries are now uh, smaller posts are punching above their weight in terms of how much business there is to be done in these smaller countries or erstwhile smaller countries. So, so they will welcome more support from more agencies from, the, from, from our federal government uh, where we can partner, uh, whether it's FCS or, or our State Department's economic officers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Markey may inquire. Um, yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, Thank you, Ranking Member uh, Ernst, and uh, thank you, Mr. Syed, for your patience uh, with the uh, senatorial confirmation uh, process. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's a tribute to your ongoing commitment to public service that you are sticking with this process, and we need people of your superb um, uh, professional training, background, experience, uh, to be uh, serving our government, so we thank you so much. You're ex extraordinarily well qualified for this job, and my hope is that we can get you a vote as quickly as possible. You know, we need you on the job, especially at this time uh, in our country, and my hope is that we can uh, get that done with record numbers of people applying for small business loans. Uh, we need the full team on the floor because our economy is driven by small businesses, so we need you there. Um, on the issue of um, women and minority businesses, I'm sure you've already discussed it uh, in the course of this hearing, but I'd love to have your views on it, you know, through the leadership of, uh, of, of this committee. Uh, we really did try to make sure that there would be funding there for minority and women businesses during the um, COVID crisis. So how do you see the terrain right now from your perspective and what would you recommend that we do in order to make sure that uh, we not only keep them in the game but uh, enhance their uh, overall uh, role? So Senator Markey, a lot of my work um, as a small business advocate has been in, in communities um, that are underserved. Uh, in black and brown communities. I, I feel in this day and age, so many um, fellow black Americans um, or Hispanic Americans are often not getting access to the uh, resources. And so it's, it's, there's an awareness gap, uh, but there's also, um, we, we just haven't, we have not been as aggressive in our outreach um, and, and understanding what the peculiar needs are. I've had the opportunity to get to know some great um, um, organizations who are present in the ecosystem, understand some of the concerns that we can hopefully address. But um, it, I will work with the administrator. I know this has been a priority for her. Uh, it's also a priority for the president to ensure that at this moment, which is a unique moment for our country, when we are going through this incredible recovery, uh, we, and we also saw the disparities in these communities, frankly, exposed during the pandemic. We saw some of the uh, businesses that are in underserved areas never came back. You know, one stat I read that almost a fourth or a fifth of black owned businesses that were shut down, they would just never come back after the pandemic. That is, that is just phenomenal to hear that. We also hear about the, uh, the, the state of entrepreneurship um, in rural communities. In the areas with about 20%, it's not down that to 20 percent again? Let's say that yeah. number again so everyone can hear it. I mean, if, if, again, if, if, if I'm not mistaken, um, the numbers that I've seen is that almost one-fourth of black-owned small businesses just would never come back from disappeared. the pandemic. Disappeared. Yeah. And again, we saw this um, challenge in all communities, but some communities were impacted more. So again, it's a reminder for us as a country that we gotta do more. And there is resources available. There is obviously great work of this Congress. I myself engage with those resources as a small business owner. And I think we need to be more intentional. We need to prioritize, continue to prioritize that. This is a priority for the administrator. It is for the president. And if I'm lucky enough to be confirmed, I will augment that uh, capacity okay, to make sure you. we are engaged with the communities. Thank you. And uh, then I want, I want to move on. I don't have much time, but to the Small Business Innovation Research Grants and the Small Business Technology Transfer Grants, SBIR and SDTR. Massachusetts has received 25,000 of these innovation grants and it's helped us to create hundreds of thousands of jobs in the state. Just last year, we, we received 615 grants 
um, valued at $373 million going into entrepreneurial companies creating uh, thousands of additional jobs. And it happens in states all across the country. I mean, this is the program that targets those small business people. And, and it creates an ecosystem of innovation for Massachusetts and the other 49 states. So um, will you commit to fighting to continue to protect and enhance those two programs? So Senator, obviously I come from the innovation ecosystem. I'm a product of that uh, uh, you know, track uh, as, as a career. And there's a role that SCTR and SBIR programs have played in spurring innovation. If I'm confirmed, um, we'll, we'll continue to make sure that we are supporting these programs and, and their implementation as well in, in uh, New England, but also around the country. Yeah, and, uh, and I'll just finish up by saying that uh, there, there is increasing concern, that we, which we should have, about monopolies across the board, concentration of power, which ultimately harms, harms smaller businesses. It's the greatest warning that Adam Smith had uh, in, uh, uh, in his works, just talking about monopolies and what they did to innovation, smaller businesses. So I just think we have to keep an eye on that. And if confirmed, I would hope that you would do so as well. Sound of the warning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Markey. Senator Ernst. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. And, and we've covered a lot of different topics today, everything from uh, child care with Senator Rosen, a, a lot of fraud topics. Um, the, the chairman had stated we've joined together on a letter to SBA concerned about the lending programs and uh, the involvement of fintech, uh, a lot of concerns there. Um, but one thing I wanted to come back to when we talk about the underserved committee or communities as well is that uh, we also have those underserved committee communities that are located in our rural areas. And oftentimes the, the focus does tend to be on more urban centers. And I come from a very, very rural, economically challenged community. And so there are a lot of uh, deserving rural communities that we should be focusing on. So I do hope that moving forward, whether it's small business, government contracting opportunities, lending programs, whatever it might be, that we also not only look at our communities of color, maybe in uh, more urban settings, but that we also look towards those economically challenged areas all across the United States in our rural communities. So uh, hopefully you'll have the opportunity to, if confirmed, come out and visit some of these rural communities and see the challenges that they face as well. So if I may say very quickly, I look forward to that. Um, I am passionate about it. My work in California has been in the Central Valley, which is a rural part of our state, mm -hmm. very similar to parts of Iowa. So that's something that is very near to my heart and certainly look forward to working with you if I'm fortunate to be confirmed. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, Mr. Chair. This was a, a very productive discussion. I think today, and I look forward to serving in this next Congress with you. Well, thank you. Uh, I believe one of our members is on his way here, uh, so uh, I'm going to hold for a moment or two. But let me uh, let you know, Mr. Syed, that this committee would, would like to get the input from the deputy administrator once you are confirmed uh, on what additional legislative tools you might need in order to deal with uh, enforcement and going after those who have misused the system. So if there's additional tools that you need, we would want that information made available to this committee. Secondly, uh, Senator Ernst and I are looking at some of the programs that have not been authorized for some time uh, and would appreciate a, a, a rather prompt review by the SBA as we consider legislation. In this Congress, uh, we know that you're always running into an election cycle, so the sooner legislation can, can be put together, the better chance we have of moving it along. And the good news about small business is that we think we can work in a bipartisan manner on, on the small business legislation. So we, we would appreciate your prompt review of the different resource partners. I've already talked about that. The certification programs that are handled under SBA, the off-ramps that are available there. We hear com concerns all the time about whether the uh, off-ramps are adequate enough to allow transition. Um, we have certification issues in regards to 
the women-owned businesses, 8A businesses, et cetera. Uh, those are issues that would be of interest to us. Uh, we have the financial tools themselves that are not all consistent, uh, as we know now on some of the underwriting issues under the rule that has been proposed. But uh, you, uh, we also had the Community Advantage, which is still a pilot program extended for two years by the administration. We're going to need input as quickly as possible on a lot of these programs. So we would appreciate you giving prompt attention to those matters so that we have an opportunity to legislate where it's needed uh, in, in this Congress. So uh, pl please uh, uh, understand that. That would be, be an important part for us. Senator, obviously, if I'm uh, lucky enough to be confirmed, uh, and obviously timing is, a, you know, is going to also be a factor there, I will be prompt in providing you with that review, working with the administrator closely. Now, after all the requests that we've all made for you to do, you still want to go forward with this thing? <laughs> <laughs> that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> well, I, I chose not to say more on that. <laughs> Uh, if you don't mind, we're going to pause for a moment and see if Senator Hawley's on his way. If he is, then I think we'll hold and give him a chance. I, I will point out, I would do this at the end of the hearing, that Senator Ernst and I have arranged for a, a tight schedule in an effort to try to expedite the, the committee's consideration. Uh, we will ask that all questions for the record uh, be due by 6 p.m. tomorrow. That's March the 9th, Thursday, March the 9th. And we would request that responses be due back by the committee by Tuesday, March 14th. So, Mr. Syed, I hope we're not interrupting your, any of your weekend plans. But uh, uh, hopefully these are not going to be that uh, difficult. But we would ask that you give these uh, responses by next Tuesday so that we can try to accommodate uh, um, consideration of your nomination in, in the committee. It reminds me of a story when I first got to the United States Senate about a senator who had called the Democratic cloakroom to say that he was on his way. Uh, would they please hold the vote open so that he could make the vote? And they asked where he was, and he said he's at the airport. So we all assumed he was at the D.C. airport, the Reagan airport. He was at the Boston airport. So <laughs> it took a little time for Senator Kennedy to get there. I don't want to tell you who it was, but... <laughs> So, we, uh, yeah, I think we're, I think Senator Hawley's a little bit closer than that, so we'll, we'll Senator Hawley, at your convenience, uh, the floor is yours for as long as you would like to take it. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the ranking member, Senator Ernst. Thanks to the witness, too. I apologize. I've come from uh, another hearing when I, where I was the ranking member. Um, let me, uh, Mr. Saeed, say thanks for being here again today. It's been a while since we talked last, and a lot has, has happened uh, since then. I imagine you've been asked um, about uh, a number of these questions, but I just want to make sure that we've covered the waterfront on this. Let's talk about Engage Action and the statements they made regarding the state of Israel so we can get this satisfied, um, these questions fully answered. And again, I'll take a look at what you've said to other, other citizens. Uh, as you know, Engage Action made a number of statements um, about, uh, about the state of Israel. You served on their board. Um, what would you say about uh, the statements that this organization on whose board you served made, and uh, how would you separate yourself from them? Senator, uh, good to see you. Um, you know, my allyship with the Jewish community, my work uh, with Israel as a partner, um, both at the State Department and as a business uh, man all my life, I think speaks for my 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 state my 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 take on this uh, on this issue. Um, I have worked uh, with with Israel-based companies. I've mentored Israeli entrepreneurs my entire life. Um, in my current role as a public servant, I'm advancing U.S. commercial interests around the world, including partnering with Israeli entrepreneurs. And so I think that is what what I uh, stand for. Um, I am. Uh, I'm not going to be able to speak for Engage's position um, on these. I have clearly shared with the board, uh, I'm sorry, with the, with, the, with the committee, in the previous process as well, as to where I stood um, on, on the questions that were asked of me. Let me just, so you say you can't speak for Engage Action, so let me just ask you your own view. Engage Action has, has said that Israel is an apartheid state. You don't believe that, do you? Senator, I have been very clear about my positions. I, I do not, uh, I have not spoken. My position on Israel is I have engaged with Israel. At the State Department, I'm engaging with Israel as a senior can I, Can I just get a yes or no? I, I think that this should be, I think, pretty easy. Is Israel an apartheid state? It's a, it's a specific term. I don't believe it's an apartheid state. And so that's, uh, again, my work and how I work with with Israeli uh, businesses and, 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 and entrepreneurs speaks for how, um, you know, how, I'm, how I'm treating um, at that ally of ours. Okay. Engage Action issued a statement of support after a House member equated Israel and the United States to Hamas and Taliban terrorist organizations. Do you think that Israel is an equivalent, moral equivalent of a terrorist organization? Senator, as I said earlier, I, I am not, uh, I am not uh, speaking for the organization. No, I'm asking you. This, this is meant, this those are not be, my views. Oh, good. I'm just looking for a yes or no. These Senator, are meant to be easy are, questions. Those are Super not my easy. views. Okay. So that the answer is no? The answer is no. Okay. Good. Um, Engage Action has issued a statement calling for a ceasefire in which they said that the current state of affairs is not a case of both sides being responsible. The state of Israel is an occupier when it comes to the Palestinians. Do you agree with that? Senator, let me just say this. Um, and I'm happy to clarify further. But my, my entire career uh, is I have engaged with the Jewish community. As I mentioned earlier, I have engaged with uh, Israel as a business person. Um, that speaks uh, for my uh, record. Yeah, but can we just answer my question? I mean, do, do you, I heard all of that, but my own question is, is this, do you think that the state of Israel is an occupier? Um, could you elaborate occupier? No, I, I'm reading to you from Engage Action. Quote, this state of affairs is not a case of both sides. They have that in quotation marks. Not when Palestinians are occupied and the state of Israel is the occupier, end quote. Senator, I'm going to speak for what I believe in, what okay. my values are. Yeah. And my values are that I have worked with Israel. I have advanced a commercial interest in, with, with Israel. But do you agree I with that statement? Just, just yes or no. I'm that, just trying to give you an opportunity to statement, do that. I know that. That's why I'm asking you if you agree with it or not. So, Senator, I am not going to be able to speak for Engage's statements. I, I don't, Engage does not speak for all my views. 
And my, again, my views on Israel and my, my work with the, with the Jewish community in the United States and around the world, I've made that abundantly clear. And a lot of the allyship that I have in this room also reflects on that in, uh, incredible support I have in the Jewish community. Hmm. Well, my time's expired, and I have, I have sorely tried the patience of the, uh, of the chairman and the ranking member who have been very gracious to hold this hearing open. So I think what I'm going to do is I'll give you some questions for the record. I mean for this to be easy. I thought your position was is that you didn't agree with any of those things. I just wanted to get that on the record. Maybe I've misunderstood. If I have misunderstood, then I'm really concerned. But I'll give you some questions for the record, and we can just put it in writing, and that way we'll allow you to go. I think you've been here a long time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. Thank and you, thank Senator. you, Senator Ernst. I'll put into the record the statement from the AJC, the American Jewish Committee, on this subject. Uh, it starts by saying they normally don't take positions on nominees, uh, but due to the innuendos concerning Mr. Syed's uh, nomination. This was from the last Congress, not this Congress. Uh, they issued that statement underscoring the support that, the, uh, that Mr. Syed has been in regards to the Muslim Jewish community and, uh, and that his association with the organization mentioned are not his views. I'll put that into the record so we have that in the record. And if there is no further business, uh, the committee, again, if we can get those answers to the questions timely, uh, the, there's a deadline of tomorrow night on questions. The committee will stand adjourned. Thank you.